today it's 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 uh, a great pleasure to have with us uh, Kate Jones, um, who who will present on World po Poetry Day in 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 verse. And Kate Jones is the present uh, is the president of uh, Caden Enterprises uh, since 1979. Uh, she's a game and puzzle designer working with recreational mathematics and uh, graphic artist, editor, and proofreader. Greetings, puzzle lovers and fans of Martin Gardner. I'm Kate Jones. I've been designing and making puzzles and tilings for 41 years, inspired by Martin's writings about pentominoes. My specialty is a category known as polyform puzzles. It gives me great pleasure to tell you more about them in this presentation for the G4G Celebration of Mind. This talk was originally prepared for 2020, and I'm delivering it on the first day of spring, 2021. I call it a periodic table of polyform puzzles. And just for the fun of it, it's written in rhyme. I'll be introducing you to 12 different styles. Here we go. Polyform puzzles are a unique branch of tilings composed of one basic shape to form large compilings. From singularity to infinity, ever more shapes they will take. And like wallpaper patterns, repeating designs they will make. Many such tessellations exist, playable art by the score. Here are a dozen. Let's explore these some more. And here you can see them, the single one of each group. The top row has square, they're called polyominoes, cubes, polycubes, the equilateral triangle, they're called polyiamonds, hexagon for polyhexes, the right triangle for polytans, and the two golden triangles, polyors. The bottom row has a rhombus, they're polyrhombs, a rhombics piece for polyrhombics, the hopscotch piece, squares shifted by half space the way you see them in hopscotch patterns. The round dominoes, they're poly rounds. Then choo-choo loops, the poly bends, that are snaky forms of quarter arcs. And the last one is the ochominoes, made of poly octs. First group is polyominoes explored and named and documented in 1953 by a young Solomon Golom. A math student was he. Each size has its own name. The best known are the fives. Solving Saul's pentominoes adds much pleasure to our lives. Here are the smallest, from one to five squares neatly built, each a new shape. Assembling them will make you skilled. Here on the chart you can see them from size 1, 2, 3, tetrominoes of 5 shapes of 4 squares each, and the 12 pentominoes. And look, they are named after the letters they most nearly resemble. The more squares we join, the more shapes will form. Each level grows to evolve its own quorum. You can't predict how many. Each builds on the previous. Combinatorics can be so devious. There is no end. Infinity's the limit. For playable fun, to human size, let's trim it. Here's how many, from size one to eight, computers define. One, one, two, five, twelve, 
35, 108, and 369. They're scaled to combine, or to stay single, or in gigantic solutions, freely to mingle. So here you see them, upper left, sizes 1 through 5, called poly 5. Below that, the hexaminos, called sextillions. In the lower left corner, all the heptaminos. And on the right, the big three-parter containing all 369 octaminos. This one includes all polyaminos from sizes 1 to 9. Carl Wilk, its solver, named it Cyclops, a great design. Not many people would have the patience to wrestle solutions from such inflations. Now for the polycubes. We call them quintillions. Not merely squares, but cubes, fantastic figures make. The pentacubes, both flat and stacked, good thinking take. Their 29 strange shapes in countless patterns to connect. While hexacubes, all 166 of them, a giant cube erect. We'll show you that one on the next page. The hexacube, 10 by 10 by 10. This is our grandest puzzle. The hexacube we craft from wood, its pieces will amaze. Its treasure chest unfolds on hinges in 11 different ways. Now for the polyiamonds. Triangles of equal size, equal lengths, and equal angles. Join two or more that fit precisely in intricate tangles. Two triangles a diamond make, from which these tiles their family name take. On the chart now you can see from the very top one, two, and three triangles. Then there are three shapes of four triangles called tetriamonds, then the four pentiamonds. The next row down has the 12 hexiamonds, six triangles each, and the bottom half are the 24 heptiamonds, each seven triangles in size, and every tile is a unique shape. Here are the polyiamonds, neatly arranged in frames. There, the iamond hex on the left. Center is the iamond ring. The large one is octiamond ring. Two sets in framed trays run the distance. From one to eight triangles, each piece an instance of a different shape each size by hue encoded, and scaled to mix and match as challenges are loaded. One little subset in round tray is just the sixes, a standalone so hard you'll marvel at its trickses. Now for the polyhexes. Hexagons from one to six, like beehives cluster. Their perfect patterns please, with shapes and luster. Hundreds of figures to solve, then play the games, and smile when you see how letters are their names. So in the chart you see, top row has the one, the twos, the threes, and the seven tetrahexes made of four hexagons each, and the bottom has all 22 pentahexes 
all different shapes of five hexagons. On the next page, we'll show you the 82 hexahexes. Here are the polyhexes forming two beautiful hexnut patterns. Majestic hexagons, like precious art, are framed in trays so that each solution, your success and skill displays. Scaled to each other, mix and match them. The copious booklets full of figures, can you catch them? On the left, you see hexnut with sizes one to five, and on the right, the huge hexnut two, containing 82 pieces, and the hole in the center, the one piece, is in there as a centerpiece. Now here are the polytans, built of half squares, like Tangram's famous pieces. Their numbers can go on forever. The math never ceases. We only go from one to six. Just look at their proliferation. These are among our toughest puzzles. No exaggeration. So on the chart you see top, singles, doubles, and triples. The second row has all the tetratans, four triangles each. And the bottom half are the 30 pentatans, five triangles each. On the next page, you'll meet the hexatans. So here we can see all the polytans filling three trays of different sizes. We call them tantrics. For centuries, a mere seven pieces kept the world amused with countless shapes to challenge and leave them enthused. As isosceles write triangles, these pieces are well known. With 107 pieces though, an answer is seldom shown. Better start with the smaller sets, tantrics one and two. From one to five, they start out easy. The small ones you can do. So from the left to the right, sizes one through five, and the giant one is your 107 hexatans with one space in the center. Now let's look at poly ores. Their name refers to gold as in the ratio that decimal of endless numbers in a row. Two different triangles are perfect shapes to form in twos and threes, this esoteric swarm. Jacques Perroul defined this strangely beautiful set. With some or all, a regular pentagon you get. The polyores form La Orastello, a beautiful pentagon. Now see this perfect star at left below, wherein all triangles their ratio show. Then marvel at the full-size pentagon at right. Can you separate the blues and white? This group is called polyroms. Diamonds of four equal lengths of side. In this case, two equilateral triangles wide. Join in pairs and trios. Colored to form dice. Their optical illusions of cubes are really nice. You can see sizes one, two, and three. And the colors are attached to them. So when you assemble them, they give the impression of cubes.
Now here are the polyrhombics. Dissect a convex polygon with even numbers of sides, with parallel lines into all the rhombuses it hides, and find it yields in singles and all possible pairs exactly the pieces needed to fill out the original shares. Rhombic circle tilings, inventor Alan Schoen declares, are a universal principle at any scale one dares. Here you see the pieces that make up the 16-sided polygon, the four singles or keystones, and the 12 pairs. Pair them in every possible concave way and get 12 rhombics twin tiles. The 16 pieces can form the original polygon in thousands of ways and win smiles. Polyrhombics can occur in many sizes. Rhombics Junior, Rhombics, and the large one, Rainbow Rhombics. Now see the underpinning geometric laws at play. The number of sides affects how many keystones array. The number of keystones, the number of colors ordains. Each color the same supply of ROMs obtains. This unique mathematical phenomenon you'll see all the way out from one to infinity. They all have ladders, top to bottom. Even the smallest one has got them. So at the left you'll see the eight-sided polygon, 16 sides in the middle, and the large one has 24 sides. Here are the poly hops. The classic hopscotch patterns staggered squares in each row slide by half a space like stairs. Here is the set with one, two, three, and four squares built. Each size has its own color and a dizzying tilt. The poly hops pieces make the hopscotch set. See now the grid, like brickwork on a hill that undergirds each fascinating figure's fill. What's tricky here is that each piece must remain in horizontal mode, a challenge for your eye and brain. Now let's look at poly rounds. Let's fill a square with circles. Then you'll notice how between the circles the opening bowed is. Let's make those into bridges, joining two or three or four. Each shape has its own color of each one or more. So here you see on the left the smallest one, round dominoes with 28 pieces. In the center, super round dominoes with 43 pieces. And finally, the largest one, grand round dominoes with 83 pieces. These wiggly pieces are called polybends. They're made from arcs of a circle. Cut a donut in four wedges. Join those arcs by their edges. Place them to build loopy tracks. Symmetries make you relax. Four sizes, each in its own hue, encloses islands. Can you do? Now let's look at polyocts. Two octagons join up, like figure eights as pairs. Now give each pair, from zero to six, some little squares to help make corners. 
24 all different tiles can fill the plane with colors separated, as you will, or color groupings, neighborly affection, a work of art, each pattern's a confection. Here are different ways to play with octagons. To tile the plane with octagons and leave no hole, you need those many squares to play a helping role. These three treat octagons in different styles, as pairs, triangulated, and edge-colored tiles. So on the left you see ochominos, made with the polyocts pieces. Many of them look like little cartoon characters. The center triangulates 20 tiles, each cut up into six triangles. On the right, Doris, with 24 tiles with every combination of three colors on their edges. Now for the conclusion, I'd like to offer a few additional thoughts. This enumeration is not the fullest score. Geometry leaves lots more of every level to explore. The essence is to find a starting point and grow, expanding ever up and outward by algorithmic flow. Each chain becomes a universe, a periodic drive, ascending and continuous, its energy alive. Each step combines from previous stages, evolution's code, and at each step we can dissect it back to its first node. Something there is in human minds that cherishes the new, that sees the beauty of emerging order, that is good and true. That's how we build a consciousness, no end in sight, and how we build the future in growing wisdom's light. Every singularity longs for an endless goal. So, mathematics models the universe's soul. Now let us trace one further, wider, mega-thought above and call the universe's combinatorial joinings love. Thank you for watching and listening to this presentation. If you'd like to have a PDF copy, please visit www.gamepuzzles.com slash periodic.pdf. And while you're in there, look around the whole website, www.gamepuzzles.com, and see over 200 beautiful original games and puzzles for the joy of thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for, for this very beautiful presentation. And actually, I do have a question for you, Kate, already. All right. Uh, it, it's a bit of a, of a personal question. Um, what, what was the first time or how did you first encounter um, polyforms? I read a book by Arthur C. Clarke, look, it's right here. In it, Clark wrote about pentominoes. And there's a little bit of story back behind that, which is the reason he wrote about pentominoes is that he, Arthur C. Clark, had read about them in articles by Martin Gardner. The connection is Martin Gardner to all of this. And at that time, they were making the movie 2001, The Space Odyssey. 
And Clark suggested to Stanley Kubrick that they should have pentominoes as the game that the astronaut played against Hal. And they even filmed it. They, they, and then they decided to scrap it because most of the people in the world wouldn't be able to relate to pentominoes. Everyone knows chess. So they went back to chess. So Arthur was a little bit put out by this and he wrote, I know this because he wrote to me about this. Um, he decided he would write them into his next book in an indelible way. If you ever made a movie or something about Imperial Earth, the pentominoes have to be in it. Well, I picked up this book in an airport newsstand in the Middle East, and I had never heard of pentominoes before. So that was, how, that was my first acquaintance. And when I came to that part in the book where he described them as being shapes made of five squares, there were no pictures. So I got my graph paper out and uh, started drawing and worked out what the shapes had to be. And then the very difficult question was, well, can you make the three by 20 rectangle? That was the plot line in the book. So I sat down and I cut paper cutouts and, and, and I solved it. And I was hooked forever. Years and years later, when Clark wrote his book about Ascent to Orbit, he has a book titled Ascent to Orbit, the history of the space program. He included one chapter, it said, help, I'm a pentomno addict. And by then he knew that we existed and made the pieces. So our address is in that book. So we dare not move because the book has our address. So, so, so that is how I first heard about combinatorial puzzles, puzzle pieces that fit together from different shapes. And it fits my philosophy, it fit my whole aesthetic so perfectly. So when we came back from overseas, we were expatriates for a few years. And I had just sold my graphic arts business and I said, well, what, what can I do next? And a friend suggested, well, why don't we make those pieces? Why don't you start a, a business and make those pieces? And the rest is history. So all of the, 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 the pentaminos that you are, um, that you showed us, uh, you, you produce and you, you, you sell also on, uh, through, through Canon Enterprises, right? Or... Yes. Now, let me show it to you. Here are some of the pieces, as you see. We make them out of maple. They're laser cut. This is my logo. Why did I pick the W as my logo? There's a good question. What is different about this piece that doesn't exist in any of the others? I'll let you think about that. So anyway, we make them and it turned out that they were three dimensional. So you end up being able to make blocks and beautiful other shapes as well. What is different about the W? So in the, in the comments, we already have someone uh, throwing in a guess, which is um, symmetry, question mark. Um, and we already have another question by, uh, by Yossi Alran uh, in the Q&A section. So I'm encouraging everyone else if, if they also want to ask specific questions. Um, and Yossi asks, when you say it took uh, 45 hours for solution, is that by hand or do you use a program, a computer program? It's by hand and everything I have done has been by hand. The only time that I have resorted to a computer, it wasn't mine. It was some big expert like George Zickerman who has programs. They, people, there's several people, Livio, Zucca and so forth. They use programs to generate the solutions to test whether it's workable and how many ways it will solve. Uh, I did every solution in the book by hand. You looked in the book about the 45 hours? Yes. Uh, it took 45 hours to solve one or two of them. One of them, I, um, I spent 45 hours on and off over two days. <laughs> and I finally said, well, I need to ask someone if it's at all possible because I'm not gonna spend 45 more hours if it's just not possible. So I wrote to um, Len, Len Gordon, who, who had a computer program, and he was playing around with those. And I said, Gordon, Len, just tell me yes or no. 
is it solvable or not? And in two days, I get back six solutions, six. And I couldn't even find one. So that was the one moment when I had, had to have help. But no, I think it's much more fun to do it. And I test everything we make because my philosophy is we design things for human beings. So it has to be fun and doable by human beings. I'm not designing things to amuse computers. I grant you, I have the greatest admiration for people who know how to program solvers, solving programs. Absolutely fantastic. That's a puzzle in itself. But for physical pieces that we have, somebody was saying symmetry, look at this. Would the computer know what symmetry is? Well, maybe they can teach it that too. But you know, they used to make symmetry. So that, that question, uh, whether the W was my logo because it's symmetrical, that's only part of the answer. There's another answer. So, so the, the same person also added, um, Alan Daltis um, is also adding that um, doesn't uh, have that, that the, 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 the piece doesn't have uh, chirality or flippability to, to have left right differences. So this is the comment. Um, I'm, hope, I'm hoping I'm, I'm doing, doing it just as reading it out. That's a very sophisticated answer, but that is not the ultimate reason. <laughs> so people can keep on puzzling. On yeah. this. Um, what, what does the W have or not have that all the others do? So I, I, I was going to, 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 to go back to, to the um, to design process of, of, your, of your pieces. Um, and I actually wanted to ask you if you, you could show us perhaps one, one of the beautiful designs that we see in, in the back, uh, just behind you. Um, I, I don't know, perhaps a poly band or... or um... well, let me insert here one explanation that comes from reading the book by Clark and to building all these puzzles. See, once we made the pentominoes, the original set, and we couldn't call them pentominoes because at that time, Solomon Golam, who had done the creative work, he owned the trademark on the word pentominoes. So I said, no, I'm not going to transgress against that. But there's another, pent means fives, but quint means fives. So we went with quintillions. So we named our series of pentomino sets, quintillions. Very soon after that, uh, Solomon lost his trademark. He lost the right to the trademark because it had become a term in the language when something becomes used by everyone and it became a mathematical term. And I consoled him, I said, look, Okay, so you lost the trademark, but you added a word to the language and that'll be forever. So, uh, so in trying to sell our, sell our puzzles, our first notion, my first notion was you sell to stores and then so stores sell it to the people. And I went into a, a game shop and they explained to me that, well, they needed something people would come in and ask for that they had already seen. And mine was sort of new and nobody knew of it. And if they would have to explain it to people, they couldn't have their people spend so much time explaining the whole thing. And then she said, the manager, but if you had a product line, we, we had a series of things that we could make a display of multiple things, then maybe uh, we could do something. So I realized that that was not the way for us to produce them. I found out that if I set up my table at an art show, people come by, they look, they touch, they try it, and they buy it. And I am happy to sit there and explain everything about it and to show it and tell them. And that's told me I needed to develop a product line as well. So my second puzzle that I designed, since the pentominoes are all based on 90 degree angles, 90 degrees squares. I said, well, what can I do if they were round, if I had 90 degree arcs? Some of the people who are watching this have seen this puzzle, many of them own this one. This is called round dominoes because they're dominoes made out of round things. And I was toying around with arcs. So if I make an arc, 
It can be convex or concave. This is the, the unit piece there, you can see it. And then two of them joined on a square grid make this peanut looking thing. But there's that thing between them holding the two circles together. So that became the bridge between them. The, uh, the in, inter, internal or concave section. So this little square in between the two circles is actually a concave circle. It's four arcs, but bent inward. And that meant that if you try to stick all these circles all over the grid, you're gonna need some open bridges because there'll be spaces left open. And what happened with this particular set that delighted me so much is that it turned out that if I wanted to fill up a seven by seven square grid, if you stick the circles together, close packing, you won't get it. You'll get a hexagon type grid, but I wanted squares. And so there are seven different shapes. It needed seven shapes and there's seven of each and they exactly tile a seven by seven grid. So it was such perfection of balance and completeness. So we started making these. By now I had two products. And then some other ideas came up and some other ideas came up. And it took a few years before I realized that this is a whole extra science of combinatorics. I'm not a mathematician. Let me backtrack right immediately. I'm not a mathematician. I can say one plus one is two, but you know, that's sort of but these are all based on mathematics that were, um, what, what did he call it? They are not, they're not technical, they're intuitive. Just like M.C. Escher, when he was making all those paintings and patterns, he said, well, he had friends who are mathematicians who used to explain to him what he was doing. And that's kind of where I am. Uh, I learned enough to be able to do this and then, of course, I always expand upward from there. And there is a set, which is not in the room, that has next size up. It goes up to size four circles connected. And the grandest one, it was in the uh, talk there, the grandest one, the grand round dominoes, goes up to size five. And it could keep going and going. I, I've tried it up to six, but it's no longer fun. It has to be fun. If it gets to be too difficult, yeah, it's, it's too much. So that was the story of how I started to develop the product line. And then after about 20 or 30 years, I realized I had a whole bunch of things that had a subcategory of polyform, where if you take a tiling, like a wallpaper tiling, a grid, of which there's 17, I'm told, and I almost believe it, you can make sets of pieces that are all different, they constructed out of the parts of the grid. That is what this is all about, is that you take the grid and you say, what are the basic pieces, the keystones? Some people call them fundamental regions, that's a mouthful. And how do they make a set of all related shapes that then work together as a group? So it's a family, every member is different, has a different personality, has different requirements, but yet you can, with some determination, get them to go together to make these incredible patterns. You notice that this is symmetrical. This is, we're very proud of this guy because it's almost perfect symmetry. See how this, the two sides here and here are not, but. So one of the first things with any new prototype where I've created the shapes and say, okay, these are the pieces that belong. Now, what can they do? And how can they fit together? Can we get them symmetrical? Can we get them colors together? Can we get them colors apart? There's a whole checklist of things. Each is a unique personality. This is also based on rounds, but instead of solid circles, they are quarter arcs. I was showing them in the talk as well. So here's a nice, pattern that has symmetry of the shapes. 
they are closed loops, they're open paths. So this was called choo-choo loops. Why did I call them choo-choo loops? I have a little story to go with that. We have a, a dear friend whom I have never met in person, but she had a son, a young boy who loved our puzzles. So it, he used to play with her collection. And one of the things I had made are teddy bears. There's a puzzle that has all different teddy bears with different poses. So we're talking combinatorics of poses and uh, shapes. And after he had been playing with those for a little while, she says, what else have you got? And I said, well, I don't know. What, what are you guys into these days? She says, well, he likes trains, trains. Well, I like trains. My daddy was a railroad engineer, <clears throat> mechanical, not driving. And uh, so I thought, well, we need train tracks. How can I make train tracks out of puzzles, uh, puzzle pieces and have them be combinatorial and have them do this and that. And so I toyed around with the tracks you see here. And I sent uh, her, her name is Lee Lucky Do. She's probably listening. Uh, I sent her one as a sort of a beta tester. I said, let's see how he can play with this set. And I have a picture of him. He's just totally adorable where he's making all sorts of designs. And one of the pieces he used to have a mustache, like a mustache. So th that's how it grew. One idea led to another, hexagons, right triangles, the, the ones I was showing you, the 12 there, but there are many more. And almost any shape, if it is a tiling, if it makes a wallpaper pattern, a symmetry group, will lend itself to being separated into pieces and combined into different shapes. I, 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 I bet that there's a lot of stories behind of, of all the, the puzzles we can see in the background. Uh, and I'm sure people will be able to find more information on 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 them on on your webpage, right? It's on. Uh... Yes, sure. One of the things I'd like to add is about my personal philosophy, that what pleases me the most with these polyform sets is completeness, completeness that everything is there, just like the the. A table of elements, the periodic table of elements, which suggested to me the title for this talk. How are all those elements made out of different combinations? I had chemistry in school and I wanted to be a chemist someday and never worked out, but I loved it. And it, it struck me that here we had at the time about a hundred elements, although Tom Lehrer did tell us that there were some that have not yet been discovered. Some of you know the song. Uh, so that is what is so fantastic to me is that you can find completeness, which will then integrate into something beautiful, coherent, useful, whatever the other virtues are that you want to lay on it. So completeness. Speaking about completeness and, and, and about, um, there's a question in the Q&A section uh, by Dale Hodge and uh, he asks, um, Fibonacci sequence appears in nature, sunflowers, etc. Does the poly uh, polynomial sequence one to eight, and then he lists it out, one, one, two, seven, 12, 35, 108, 30, uh, 369 appear in nature, mathematics or elsewhere? The sequence that I named was the number of pieces at that size level. That is not a Fibonacci series. It just pretends to be. It, it seems to be. Uh, there is no way to predict how many will be on each level. For example, there's only one, one, one square. There's only one domino. The moment you get to three, it diversifies. You have a straight and you have a V. So there's two trominos. The only way you can figure out what is the next level <clears throat> is to attach another square on each of them in all possible positions, get rid of the duplicates and it makes five. Now, Tetris came along and said there's seven, but that's only because it couldn't turn the piece over. 
So it inserted the mirror image of the two pieces and made seven, but there are only five. And the only way to find out how many are made of five squares is to attach a fifth square on every edge of the tetrominoes, the fours, throughout your duplicates. And that makes the 12. This to me is a wonderful proof, if you like, of evolution versus creationism. Because <clears throat> as I said, the creation process is to make it evolve. That is the process of creation is to step by step by step. What is the next level it can go to? What is the next stage? But you cannot get it from a mathematical formula or an equation or an algorithm that says, okay, so eight squares will make no, you can't. The only way to get it is out of the seven. Dale Hodge is raising his hand to, to I guess, follow up on, on, his, on his question. The real question is um, the number sequence 1, 1, 2, 7, 12, 35, 108, 369, and whatever would be next with nine polyominoes. What, does that appear elsewhere in math, in nature, or in in electricity, I, I don't know, I don't know where it might be, but does that appear in other places? Not that I know of, except a lot of people have the whole table of them up to about 10 or 12 or 20, uh, going into the billions and trillions uh, on their websites. People have figured this out by computer, how many members, 1285 would be the next one up. Uh, but no, I do not believe that there's a parallel to this not an identical one. The idea that things grow and evolve applies to every polyform set. Every polyform set, you can say, how many will the next one go to? You know, I said the, prol the proliferation on one of those. It surprises at a level four already, it was so huge that I didn't want to go to the next level of five because then it overwhelms you. It's just, as I said, we wanted to keep it to the human size, but mathematically you could work out the sequence for every polyform set, it'll be unique and different to that, to that set. I need to say something about the music that played uh, behind my talk. I didn't have on the sheet, on the pages, the credits, but that was music composed and played by a dear friend of mine named Sergei Novikov. He used to be Russian, he is now very much American. He's a brilliant composer, a uh, virtuoso pianist. And I had I met him at these art shows where we exhibit. He sometimes has a tent and he sells his CDs. And the particular one that I used is a piece that's the final piece in a CD called Jump for Joy. He had composed all these pieces strictly for kids. And I said, but I love them. I'm not, I'm not a kid, but yes, I am a kid, all right. So they are absolutely wonderful. I don't think he has them on his website anymore, but you could maybe make him think about it again. Um, this was the 11th track of things that were very lively and wonderful. And this last one was mellow and it's a 10 minute piece. It's supposed to help the kid go to sleep. The idea is if you go to sleep and the title of it was, please may I stay up a little longer? That's the name of the song that I played. Uh, we just have one last question coming in uh, from Alan Bates. And then there's a big, big, big puzzling behind the, the, your logo and two or three uh, solutions have been proposed. Uh, but mm -hmm. first a question. Uh, you often present uh, at art fairs and Renaissance fairs. How do you explain the interesting over, uh, overlap between those interests and your game puzzles? Well, the art shows and the Renaissance Festival are absolutely perfect markets for me to show and sell. I can't sell any other way except on my website. And really, because our work is so unusual, people will not be able to look at just the pictures in the website and know exactly what it's about. It's because I sit there and I let them handle them and show and play, try it out, see how you do with it. That is what makes the customers interested. Now, as far as art, I think that what we do is a form of art. And there have, has been much said about math as art, math as art. 
And actually I started out as art and then later found out that I could plug the math part into it as well. Because math, the word math still scares people, even with our very advanced technology nowadays, there are still people who are afraid of math. And so if I say this is math, I, I do now say playable math. I've, I've, I've actually registered that as a trademark, playable math, that's me. Because it won't scare them if it's playable, right? But math is the purity of it. It's what I said in my poem, mathematics is the language of the universe. And so I have a huge respect for it, even though I'm pretty much an ignoramus on the technical parts of it. That's how they get combined, that art, art shows beautiful designs, the puzzles make beautiful patterns, and they can make many patterns. It is not a single answer puzzle. This is one of my criteria is that every set has to make many different things. So you have open-endedness forever after. If it were just a single puzzle that's so hard, you just do it one time and that's all there is. So what? So what? That's fine if you like that sort of thing, but for the long run, a puzzle that you can create into many, many designs. It's a little bit a parallel to the human mind, which I often talk about, is how you can have an idea and then your imagination will create new things with it. See how imagination is using your mind to form different things. And we need that. We need variety. We need diversity. We need uh, creativity. And so this is, this had just turned out to be perfect um, medium for me to work in. So that's why it's now 41 years and I'm not quitting. Look, lucky for us. Um, so to, to finish with, with the, the puzzle you, you left us with, I think everyone is very interested in, in knowing what, what makes the, the, the Kadon Enterprises uh, logo so special. And some, some guesses have been that it uh, is the well, only- let me do the guesses before I tell the answer. So some guesses are that it's the only uh, pentomino piece which can be made up of all other pentomino pieces. And the other guess that I, I found in, in the in the chat, I didn't I didn't fact check that one. Um, and, um, and the other one is that it's the only pentomino piece which uh, lacks uh, three squares in a row. That is the answer. It's the only one with not three, no three. So it shares four cubes with all, all but the eye. The eye doesn't share, but all the other pieces have four in common with the W. It is also symmetrical diagonally. It is the letter E, it is the letter M, it is the number three, and it is the W. And we call it the W because Solomon Golam named it that. But that is correct. That was that is the uniqueness of this piece. It does not have three. All the others do. I think with this we we come come to the end of of uh, the presentation. So thank you so much, uh, Kate uh, Kate Jones, for for this beautiful presentation. And uh, people can follow up with you through your website, I believe. I think this concludes our presentation for today for World Poetry Day. Uh, again, Kate, uh, I cannot thank you enough for, for the very, very beautiful um, presentation, which, which mes mesmerized all of us. And, and yeah, thank You're you. You're too kind. You're too kind. But thank you for your gracious comments. And uh, on the website, there's a whole bunch of things you can look at other than uh, just having things for sale. There are lots of different features, articles, stories. Thank you once more, Kate, and- um... My enormous pleasure. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll see people later again somewhere sometime, that you, all of you, please stay well, stay healthy, stay safe, stay amused, keep your brains going with puzzles. Thank you, Tiago, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.